Hello and welcome to Authentic Church. My name is Kevin Hockenberry. This is my wife, Stacy. We are the co-pastors here of Authentic Church that meets in Winter Springs, Florida. And before we get into the message, we want to give you the opportunity to give to the tithes and the offerings of Authentic Church. Click the link in the description bar. We really hope you enjoyed today's message. For those of you that are newer to the church, you may not have heard the story yet, but uh, years ago, the Lord dropped the, the word authenticity in my wife's heart. And it's something we always tried to live by as it, as it goes according to scripture. And then years after that, when the Lord asked us to start a church, how do you even name a church? Like, where do you even start, right? I mean, that's just one of those things that's not easy to do. Um, and within a few moments after really deciding we're going to start a church, um, I felt the Lord bring that word authenticity back to us and that we were, we were going to be authentic church. <laughs> now, I did that at the goodness and purity of my heart, I promise you, and, and really with the Lord's prompting. But what I didn't realize is uh, you'll constantly have people looking at you like, so what makes you authentic? <laughs> That's a pretty, pretty big name you use there. Is, are you saying our church is not authentic, but yours is? Like, seriously, I've gotten this stuff before. What makes you authentic, right? And then God forbid you make a mistake. <laughs> you, you mess up and you, you do something you shouldn't. And then, oh, that's very authentic of you, isn't it? <laughs> and it's, it's a hard word. And, and listen, it's a hard word to live up to oftentimes. And, and in our sermon planning and, 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 and all these meetings that we have, um, as, as we're planning the calendar of the church and what we're doing when, when we're doing something at something uh, that the city of Winter Springs is putting on and there's thousands of people coming out there. We always ask ourselves, is this something that makes sense through the lens of authentic? Does that make sense? And so it's, it's a big word to, to, I mean, imagine just personally, if you walked around and you introduced yourself, hey, I'm Steve. How you doing, Steve? I'm authentic. <laughs> like, think about what you're living, what you're trying to live up to when someone says that. And, um, it can be tricky because it really is a lot to live up to, how, how Stacy and I and the team live out our faith, you know? And I mentioned that sometimes we're accused of not being authentic because in someone's eyes, we weren't. And it's not easy to live up to, to, to a name like that. But at the end of the day, for, for me, what I really want to, where I really believe authentic means as opposed, as, as pertains to our church, is that it's living out a Bible-based life as best we know how. And we're trying to figure it out as we go so often. Amen? For us, the most important thing here at Authentic Church is the Word of God. And I think if you've been with us for however many you know, weeks, months, years you've been with us now, uh, you would probably agree that we, we crack this thing open and we preach God's Word every week. Amen? Um, because it's the Bible that is our kind of, it's our, it's, our, it's our foundation, this is where we, where, where we get um, our faith from. Yes, every church should be about Jesus first. And I agree with that. And we are. But the reality is, is the story of Jesus is found here. Amen. And, and I, I would rather be known um, for uh, as a pastor, as a church, that's more about the Bible, even than some of these other things, because some of these other things that are so important, whether it's worship, whether it's prayer, whether it's justice, whether it's encountering the Holy Spirit, healthy marriages and healthy relationships, being active in our community and serving the widow and the orphan and people who need it. That's all so, so, so important and vital to our faith. But at the end of the day, you can't say you're about all those things, right? But if the Holy Bible isn't at the top of our priority list, we can quickly get off track. And I've seen people do it. I've seen people do it. And the Bible isn't meant to be worshipped, but it points us to the one who is to be worshipped and shows us how to worship him. Real Christ-like authenticity comes from the author of the Holy Bible. Amen? Now, there are some hard teachings in the Bible, and there's some hard teachings in Scripture, and there's things that Jesus said that are always not always easy to he hear, and sometimes they don't always go down very nicely um, because, well, Jesus said what was on his heart, right? <laughs> he said what he said, and he didn't really care about feelings as much. Um, and, and some of God's laws are in direct opposition even to the culture we live in today. But we have to talk about biblical truths, e even the hard things. And um, the reality is, is that I hear from time to time um, from people who come here and they find this refreshing. What is this? 
the fact that you don't talk about money all the time. <laughs> I literally, I, I, can't, I probably hear that every few weeks. Like, thank you for not constantly talking about money. The reality is in this church, when it, when it comes to financial giving, the only time we ever really talk about it is in that little one minute window, right? Typically there, one, one two minute window. And then once or twice a year, I will talk about it, I will preach about it. And then usually we'll have some kind of giving campaign uh, one time a year. And that's, that's it. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at some of these hard teaching as opposed, as, as, as it pertains to giving. Now, I know you're here and you're like, <sighs> this, is, this is my first time in church in a long time and you're going to talk about giving. Well, I am. And it's a very important thing. And I, I believe that when we're all done with this, it'll be a re very refreshing way of, uh, of looking at it. Because the Bible has a lot to say about this topic, including the words of Jesus. And I've heard the Bible misrepresent it manipulate it and misquote it to convince people to give. And we've all been to that church or have heard about that church that all they ever do is talk about money. Today, my goal is to take a look at scripture and see what it has to say about this topic. My goal is to do this in an authentic way. That's my, my goal. That's what I'm trying to do. And I believe for some of you, this will be very inspirational and at the same time, very motivating. Now, two things that I do not intend to do, and I need you to hear me because this is, this, is, this is the deal. I, I'll be honest with you. Um, giving is so important. We have to talk about it. But at the same time, it has such uh, a bad reputation for, for some people who have sat through, you know, giving sermons and heard ch churches talk about it for, you know, off and on through the years. And just, man, it's one of those things that even as a pastor, when I bring this message to you, uh, I want to bring it in, in, in a very real way. Um, but even I wrestle with it a little bit, you know, and I remember just even this past week, just sitting in my office and talking with someone about it and what's coming. And, and I was just kind of pouring my heart out a little bit. And he's like, well, that's what you should preach right there. <laughs> preach that because I've never heard churches talk about giving like that. And so that, that's my intent today. And, and like I said, there's two things that I do not intend to do. I don't intend to turn you upside down and shake all the, the gold coins out of your pocket. That's not my intention today. Um, I don't want you to feel any pressure whatsoever. We're going to see what the Word of God has to say. And I'll let the Holy Spirit talk to you about that. Amen. Um, I also don't want to make you feel guilty if your giving capacity is very small or minimal um, and you're, or you're just not simply ready to make that decision to start being financially uh, generous. My point in the sermon is to move the needle of generosity in our lives, to reveal the teachings of God's holy word, because as disciples of Christ, we cannot be a disciple without being generous. I'm telling you, those two things go hand in hand, hand in hand. And, and there are people that have been in the church for, for 25 years and just have never been generous and have never given. And I just, I don't understand that. Um, and and we'll, we'll explain some of that here in a little bit. But the, the title of the sermon today is simply this, Giving Is. Giving Is. And we look at a few things that giving is according to Scripture. First thing is this, if you're taking notes today, giving is following God's example of generosity. Giving is following God's example of generosity. It all starts here. We serve the most generous God of all time. Of all the gods that have ever been gods, fake gods, all that stuff, we know we, tr we serve the one true living God who has given so much for us. And here's just a few verses um, to talk about God's generosity. We know John 3, 16, right? For this is how God loved the world. He gave. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I love James 1.5. These are just different verses talking about how, how, how generous God is. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. God is a generous God. He wants to give. Uh, so if you sinful people, this is from Matthew 7, 11, If you sinful people know how to give good gifts, this is Jesus' words right here. If, if, basically, if you people, right, you, you, uh, the, the mankind knows how to give good gifts to your children, uh, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? Giving is following God's example of generosity. It's a direct response to what God has done in your life. I'm going to use some illustrations this morning, and this is one that, that I, I was just thinking about that makes sense in my mind. It's like having a neighbor 
that is always doing something nice for you and your family, has given so much to you. Man, they'll cut your grass if you're sick or if you're away on, on vacation. They'll bring you a box of diapers when a new baby arrives. They'll bring you a taste of what they cooked. Um, pay, paying attention, paying for, I'm sorry, paying for something that affects both of your properties. Like, hey, man, I got, we got to put a new fence up. I know you're struggling. Like, oh, I got it, you know. Um, I've been blessed with a neighbor like that. Uh, my next door neighbor, he's a, he's a Kansas City Chiefs fan. I, I don't hold that against him. It was not easy uh, in the month of February to be neighbors with him. Uh, no, I'm kidding. He's, he's, a, he's a really good dude. And him and I have just kind of connected. And it seems like we're each giving each other something constantly. Uh, this past weekend, I made, a, I don't know why. You ever just get in the mood for something? Where are my cooks at? Where are my cooks? Who cooks in here? Who cooks in here? You ever just get in the mood for something? And you're like, I want to make that. <laughs> And I don't know why I have a Blackstone, and I don't know why I was like in the mood for cheesesteak sliders, right? So I went to Publix, and I, and I got some ground sirloin and some, some chuck, uh, some, 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 what do you call it, ground chuck. And I mixed those together with a little Worcestershire sauce. I say that Worcestershire? I think I did good. A little SP, a little garlic, you know what I mean? And uh, I got these really nice soft rolls that had just been baked that day. And I got some onions and some mushrooms, and I made these things on my Blackstone. Let me just tell you something. And my wife knows this. If I don't cook something good, I'm the first one. I just get upset. I, I mess. Let me tell you something. They were so good. They were so good. And I, and, and, and I, I started pulling them off the grill and I'm, I'm, pull, I'm pulling them to the side. And like, I couldn't wait to sit down with my family. So I started eating one, right? It was so good. And so what did I do? I text my neighbor from Kansas City. I'm like, yo, <laughs> I just made these cheesesteak sliders, man. Come grab one. So he comes, he, I'm on my way over. He comes walking over, you know, and I give him this cheesesteak slider. I'm like, bro, he takes a bite. I'm like, bro, right? But right, right? <laughs> He's like, man, what did you do to this? This is incredible. <laughs> but I have this relationship with my neighbor where like when I am leaving for a couple weeks, we take care of each other. He'll do it for me or whatever. And that's the relationship that we've done. And I don't do it because sometimes you can feel like, oh, this person's done so much for me and like we got to do it for that. It's not even about that. It's about, man, he's been so kind and, and generous to me. Like I want to be kind and generous back to him. And I think giving is a direct response to what God has done in, in, in your life. And, and, and God has done so much for us. If everyone in this room gave a testimony about his goodness, here are some stories that we might hear. Right? If, 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 I just, if, I put a mic, if I put a microphone in, in everyone's face this morning and say, hey, talk about how good God is, you might hear someone say, I, I heard his voice when I thought I was completely alone. I was an addict, but he completely set me free and restored wasted years. He, he gave me joy in the midst of depression. In a season of loss, he gave me something new. When I was sick, he was at my bedside. When I was weak and when I wasn't good enough, he showed up and made me enough. When I sinned so deeply and thought he would turn his back on me, he sat with me and called me daughter. He called me son. God gives, and God has done so much for us. And giving also reveals, and I believe this with all my heart, how mature our relationship with God is. Back to the example of the giving neighbor. If he or she never gave you anything, then you may never do anything for them. I mean, who knows, right? But however, if they are incredibly generous to you, you give back, like, a lot. When you're on vacation and you stop a little tourist trap, you might see something that would look good in his garden or her garden. Like, you think about them even when you're traveling. It shows a maturity in the relationship you have with your neighbor. Now, some of you don't have good relationships with your neighbors. Some of you don't talk to your next door neighbor, right? Don't even know who they are. But some of us, we have people in our lives that are so good to us that we can't help but to be so good back to them. Some people meet Jesus and never really grow much in their relationship with him. If truth were to be told, Jesus is much more like an acquaintance than a friend for some people. But for those of us that have really allowed Jesus to come into our lives and really transform us and really fill us with joy, giving is just something we can't help but to do. Amen. The second thing is this, giving is reaping what we have sown. 
Giving is reaping what we have sown. The Bible is very clear about this concept. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't wait, I'm sorry, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. We've heard that before. Verse eight, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10, and this is important. For God is the one who provides seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce, I'm sorry, produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Verse 11, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Verse six says it real simply and real plainly there, right? Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. For those of you that have ever had a garden, right? You, you plant three tomato seeds, you might get three tomato plants. You plant a thousand tomato seeds, you might get a thousand tomato plants. It's just that simple. But you determine how much to give. Don't be pressured into it. And I need you to hear that this morning. Because that's, my, that's not my goal as a pastor, to make everyone in this church feel like compelled that you have to give and give and give and give so much. Like That's between you and God. My job is not to make you feel bad or make you feel pressured about giving to the kingdom of God. That's not my job. That's not my role. My role is to proclaim the truth of God. Make sense? Verse 8 says it there. Should people cheat God? I'm sorry. I want to go to, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna go to uh, Malachi chapter 3 for a moment. Because this is where the church has gotten it wrong when it comes to um, trying to force people and and make people feel pressure to give and all that kind of stuff. Um, This is where the church has gotten it wrong. And if if you have grown up in the church in any way, at any time, you've probably heard uh, Malachi chapter 3 because it's been misused quite a bit. Malachi, just to help you guys understand, it's that last book in the Old Testament. That's part of the old law, right? So a new thing happened when Jesus came and it's a new covenant. But Malachi chapter 3 says this, and some of you will have flashbacks of the church you grew up in when I read this. (laughs) Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. And I'm going to say something that may sound crazy to you, but I believe, and this is just how I interpret scripture. This is, this is me, right? I believe for years, pastors have weaponized the scripture and they have told us that we are robbing and cheating God if we don't tithe, which in this verse says it leads to being cursed. As your pastor, I I want to help. I, I want to say this. Every curse was broken at the foot of the cross. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But, but if you feel bad, if, if you're in like financial struggles right now and, you, and you're really struggling um, or, or, or maybe you're newer to Jesus and, and you're like, I don't give 10% of my money. Like, so that means I'm under a curse. I am familiar with churches that would say yes. Um, I do not believe that to be true. Again, I believe every curse was broken at the cross. And we're going to get into this a little bit. However, this verse in Malachi is a part of the old law, which is what I was talking about before. What does the New Testament have to say? To it? What, what would Jesus or Paul have to say about living under this old law, right? Uh, Galatians chapter 3, if you have your Bible, Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read a few verses here. Verse 10, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under a curse. For the scripture says... Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. Verse 11, so it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep up with the law. For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Pause. So what's happening here is the apostle Paul is talking to these Jewish people and he's saying, you're trying to live right and justly through, through, through this old law. 
you're going to break the law. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to lie sometimes. You're going to get upset with somebody and, and you're, you're going to have issues. You're going to really struggle. And so if the law, the law can't be your savior, that Jesus comes in and he's your savior, having faith in him is where you, is, is where you uh, find eternal life. It's where you find a life of joy in, in, in Jesus. Amen. This way of faith, verse 12 says, is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But what Apostle Paul is saying here, it's not through obeying the law that you have life. It's putting your belief and your trust and your faith in Jesus. That's where you find life. Amen. Look at verse 13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. If you have a relationship with Jesus and someone calls you cursed for any reason, including whether you tithe or not, I would bring them these words from the apostle Paul. Believers cannot be cursed. We cannot be. I, I believe that with all my heart. I've had, I've had people, uh, we had someone recently walk by HQ and it looked like she was casting a spell on HQ. It was weird. We were sitting there drinking our coffee and we looked out and there's this lady and she's just like doing something like this. And it was like, huh. And Stacey's like, mm-mm. <laughs> and, and my thought was like, yo, you can't curse us. Like, do you know who I am? I'm the son of the most high God. You're not cursing me. Like, that's not happening. Like, I don't even have to do like, use the force back on you or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, for me, it's just like, bring it. Like, what? What are you going to do? You know what I mean? Um, but it's different, man. We, and, and, and so this is a very important thing. Now, I do want to continue reading into this, ma this, part of, part, um, this part of Malachi here because I want to ask a couple questions and then bring a couple answers. But what is the tithe that Malachi speaks of? Well, it's 10%. The tithe is 10%. But this is what's important. It's linked to the storehouse. Now, the storehouse, when you go back uh, in, in the original language, uh, is where the treasure was kept. It is a place to store up supplies. It was where weapons would have been stored. In other words, it's the kind of place people went to when they have all kinds of different needs in their lives. Make sense? So, and, and, but in Malachi specifically, and in the Old Testament, we see a lot of times the storehouse was spoken of as the temple. So the, the thought and the premise was bring the tithe uh, into the, if everyone's tithing, everybody's bringing that into the temple, we will always have stuff when we need it. We will never, like if a, if a famine happens, we'll have rain, we'll have food. No matter what happens, we will, if, if we're going to go to war, we will have the weapons to fight because we have stored these things up. And this is, this is something I, I really need everyone to hear because this is so vital. The tithe and the storehouse are inseparable. You are not biblically tithing when you're giving 10% of your money to fill in the blank. The local pregnancy crisis center, paying off lunch debts incurred by high schoolers, the TV evangelist, that's not tithing. That's just doing something nice. Make sense? But there's, there's, a, very, there's a very real biblical principle because we're going to get to this in a moment. And I've said this before. And I've heard other preachers say this before too. If every believer tithed to the storehouse, churches would be able to meet every need in their community. But because only a percentage of Christians tithe, pastors often have to say, I'm sorry, but we don't have anything to give. I hate being in that position. I saw a thing on Facebook the other day in one of those um, community groups, and this lady was like, oh, does anybody know of any churches, you know, or organizations that can help me pay my rent? <laughs> and I saw that, and my heart kind of hurt a little bit because I was like, dang it, man, I'd, I'd really love to just be able to send her a message and just say, hey, come, come, come visit us at Authentic Church. But we're just not there yet. And as a pastor, it stinks, man, when I got to tell people, I'm sorry, I don't have it. And people get upset. Oh, you're the church. You're supposed to give. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I agree. But we can't always do that. If everyone gave this way, giving provides the ability to prosper in the drought. That passage we read a, a moment ago um, in Galatians, man, it, man, it talks... I love what it says there. Just about just ha having having what we you know what, what what we need when we need it. Second Corinthians nine eight says this, and and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. 
the tithe fills the storehouse. So the storehouse is ready when needed. The storehouse pays the bills. <laughs> this is not cheap to rent this or to rent the cafeteria or to rent our headquarters. Um, giving is reaping what we have sown. Malachi 3.10 goes on to say this, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will pour open, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine and but before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then the, all the nations will call you blessed for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's army. There is a promise that comes with tithing. And I know the question you're asking right now, if this is part of the law, hasn't that concept of tithing expired? No. Luke eleven forty two. This is the words of Jesus. He's in. Get, he's right in the middle of getting into it with the Pharisees, and so he's talking to the Pharisees. He says, "What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens." In other words, they were legalistic about it. We're giving ten percent on anything. Like if there's seventeen leaves of oregano. I'm giving 1.7 when I come to church. That's what he's saying here. Literally, they were so legalistic about this. But you ignore justice <laughs> and the love of God. So he's saying you, you're focusing on this, but like at the same time, these really huge things, loving people, loving, you know, loving God and, and, and justice, you're, you're missing out on that. And then he says this, though. He does say this. You should tithe. Yes but do not neglect the more important things. So even Jesus is saying, yes, tithing is, should be a part of your life. It should be a part of your relationship with God. It should be a part of your, 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 your obligation when you go to the temple, when you go to church, right? Yes, you should tithe. But in the midst of getting into it, the Pharisees who were boasting about living by the law, Jesus says it, you should tithe. But don't neglect the more important things. And Jesus emphasized the importance of tithing and endorses as something that we should still be doing. But listen, there's also a warning in there. If you missed it, it says, it really jumped off the page to me. It's, this is, this is a warning for all Christians. It is possible to pay your tithes every week and miss out on some of the more important things of our faith. It's not a legalistic thing. It's something we do because God has been good to us, because we want to give back, because it is, it is a command. It is something we're supposed to be doing. Giving is something that you're able to do when you're fiscally responsible. That's my last point today. And I believe this is one of the big issues we have for a lot of Americans. Um, I think a lot of Americans just simply don't live by a budget. Just have never really taken time. <laughs> you know, I remember when we were younger, it felt like oftentimes... We spent money until we got the notification from Bank of America that your, dra your account has been overdrafted. <laughs> um, and so many people live that way. So many people living paycheck to paycheck. And, and so many people are buying more house than they really need. And, and, they're, and they're buying more car. My God, can I just, as a, a friend, you don't need the big car. Can I just say that? Now, if you can afford it, God bless you. Go for it. But like, I know people that, are, that have eight, twelve, two thousand dollar $2,000 a month car payments. And like, it doesn't fit in your budget. It's not there. There's no room for it. And this, and this is why a lot of times I think, and then, then you come to church and, 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 and it's time to, I want to give back to God, but there's literally nothing in my account to give. And my credit cards are kind of maxed out. And so now, remember at the beginning of the sermon, I said, I don't want you to feel, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty about anything today. That's not my point. But that's a reality a lot of people live by. Um, I love Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth. And with the best part of everything you produce, then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. That, that wine that's like at the eye level at Publix, right? But I do believe you have to have it to give it. And um, I just, I really... We're gonna offer some courses here to help people with their finances and, and budgeting and all that kind of stuff. 
because man there's something there's nothing like living according to a budget and i know that sounds restricting it might sound kind of the opposite um, of, of liberty but it, it is so liberating when you live according to a budget and if you if your parents didn't show you how to do that if you didn't learn how to do it in school if you're in your 20s and 30s 50s 60s whatever and you still don't live by a budget man come see me I, I would love to point we have some people in the church that can help you with that as well but it's so important because when you budget you have room to give you have room to do the things that you want to do and that's why you're living according to a budget is so important but at the end of the day, and I'm, I'm just about finished here, and I want to just say this. I talked about this earlier, about how I believe that there's a, um, the, the way in which we give uh, really shows how mature we are in our faith. And I have been in ministry over 20 years now, and I want to just show you kind of like a little, just a little image. I, I thought about this as I was preparing this message, but I feel like this is sort of the giving spectrum that as you become more mature in your faith, this is kind of the way you begin to start moving. Um, and I, I've seen people that for years that just attend church and never give a dime, never give one red cent. Um, I don't understand, that's like showing up to a birthday party and not bringing anything. I never understood that concept, but but that's that's the reality. That's just where some people are. And so my, my whole hope today is that we can begin to move people down the spectrum just a little bit, move the needle just a little bit. And then there's some of us that we just, we tip. That's what we do. And like, oh, I, you know, I'll, I won't drink a Starbucks drink this week and I'll give, you know, a little bit in the offering. And there's just no sacrifice involved, really. It's just, I just, here you go, God, here's, here's 15%, you know, whatever. Like you would at a restaurant. Um, but then there, then I think you, you start getting into generous giving. And generous giving is where you're like, I don't know about this whole tithing thing, <laughs> but I want to be generous. And I want to, if there's a need, I want to help meet it. And, and if that means I, I, I can't go to, you know, Disney World this week or something, then, I'll, then I want to give. I want to be generous. Um, but then I think as we continue to mature as believers, then we, we really do. And I love it, man. When people get it, they begin to tithe. And they begin to give that 10% that the scripture talks about. And, and I'm just telling you, man, God is so good and so faithful when we're obedient in that, in that act of tithing. Um, and then beyond tithing is just that, I would call it like Jesus-like giving, right? That's that lay, he laid down his life for us. That's just whatever you need. The tithe is kind of where I start. What missionary needs to be supported? What, what, what pregnancy crisis center in the community needs to be supported? What, what, what food bank is short on food right now? And uh, so for, for me, as I was processing this, I was thinking, like, this just shows where so many people that attend church every week are. Um, so as we wrap up this morning, I just, I just want to say thank you so much for, for listening to this. I mean, this is, this is God's word as, 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 as it pertains to, to giving. He wants, he wants to be such a good giving God to us, and He is. And He expects us to give back in return. And we've got a, a thing coming up at the end of this year. We're going to do uh, a one day, uh, a giving day of generosity um, for the youth of our community. And um, it's still kind of being fleshed out right now, but our goal is to raise a certain amount of money um, and give a good portion of that to Verity, which is our youth ministry here in the church. Um, but I also want to do some really nice things for the high school here. There's a lot of kids here that come from poverty, believe it or not, even though it's winter springs, it's just the truth. And whether they owe lunch money or they can't afford a cap and gown, I want to be able to, to give towards that. And then we also have uh, some missionaries in the community that we really love and we already support. And we want to do something nice for them at the Christmas, in the Christmas season. But I, I want to be able as a church to give more and more and more. As far as where we're at as a church, uh, with, a, with us being a church plant, there's a lot of just, um, the needle's been moving and giving, right? We, we couldn't just as a church just begin to give 10% when we first start, uh, but we're getting there. My goal is hopefully, and hopefully as soon as next year, we will begin giving 10% of everything that comes in uh, and then send it right back out these doors uh, into local things that are happening in the community, to missionaries across the world, to orphanages, like you name it. I have a whole list of people and organizations that I want us to support. So that's what's coming for us. Um, anyway, my final statement is this, and you can write this down, take a picture of it, but I'll leave you with this thought, this closing thought. Giving is complete trust in God. 
the end of the day, that's what it is. It's a, it's a belief. I believe in you, God. I believe in your holy word. I believe this is something I'm supposed to do. Here it is. I give it to you, and I trust you. Amen? Amen. Uh, I'm going to pray and dismiss us in just a moment. Um, when I'm done praying, the, the offering slide will pop up. If, if anyone does have it on their heart before they leave, if you would like to, uh, to, to give, you, you, can, you can do that. Um, and I also want to remind you, man, come back next week. Next week is going to be incredible. I'm really looking forward to this message about freedom in Jesus. It's going to be so, super, super powerful. I can't wait to preach this message. But with that said, let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this time this morning that we've had as a, as a body of believers. Uh, Lord, I, I met a lot of new faces today. And God, I pray that um, they would just really sense your presence in this room. They would know that you're here. Lord, for all of us, as we exit the building today, I pray that we would sense the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for next week. I thank you for this sermon, this word you've been putting on my heart. And I pray that the, the right people would get into this room. And by the right people, God, people that you're calling right now, people that need to be here to, to hear this message. We love you so much. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. You are dismissed.